This is the SMSL M200 digital to analog converter. And for under $300, it is packed with features. It has Bluetooth input, balanced output. It has a high-end AKM converter chip, the 4497, and it has very excellent measurements. So what I wanted to find out is, can a DAC that's under $300, with all these features and excellent measurements, sound good? So I compared it to this whole bunch of gear to find out. So I've got the M200 sitting atop the SP200 headphone amp, which I've reviewed before. You can actually check that out. I'll put a little thing up in the corner so you can get a link to that. Now, the SP200, it's an interesting combination to offer because the M200 kind of is advertised as a balanced output primarily, although it does have single-ended outputs. And this actually, even though it has balanced uh, dual 3-pin XLR inputs, the actual circuitry inside the amp is only single-ended, and just ignore the fact that it has a 4-pin XLR on the front. That's nothing to do with the circuitry. It is just a connector. Now, although, albeit, one you see commonly on balanced amplifiers. So you kind of have a choice if you do get the pairing, which they sell for around $500. You can uh, use, a say, basic single-ended RCA cables, and you'll have the DAC will convert the balanced signal to single-ended before sending it to the SP200. Or you could use kind of dual 3-pin uh, XLR connectors and... Uh, you could you connect the M200 to the SP200 that way, and then the SP200 will do its usual conversion to single-ended. Kind of six or one, half a dozen the other. Just, I reckon, just do what's convenient. Anyhow, with that, let's just take a look on what's on the back, because it's always a good to start with what the inputs are. Well, taking a look at the back and the inputs and outputs, well, the first is the power, and it uses a 5-volt power input, and 5 volts being extremely common. It, there is quite a bit of potential there to use an alternative power supply if you maybe want to experiment using a better power supply as the sound quality of a DAC is very related to the quality of the power input. And But the power brick that it did come with for the 5 volt power supply was a 4 amp module and 4 amps is quite a lot. I don't know if it actually would use all 4 amps but something worth considering all the same. But if you do go down that kind of audio rabbit hole, you can't just start to wonder, shouldn't I just buy a better DAC? Maybe like this SU9 here I've got in for review. That's something to consider because they can get a little bit expensive. Likewise, with USB, most people will just plug this in to their computer via a regular USB cable or whatever come, came in the box. And some people, of course, again, go into uh, you know noise filters and that kind of thing. As USB can be a little bit noisy from a computer, but generally the uh, quality, you know, the, the handling of noise and other issues from USB is pretty good in most DACs these days, and I didn't have any issues. Now, if you do go for the old kind of old school connection, you have your standard Sony Philips digital interface here, SPDIF. And that has been around since they started splitting CD players and digital to analog converters instead of putting them in one box. It actually used a different connector, one that wasn't so confusing with the analog outputs. But still, it's it's still around these days and still in use. You don't get your you get to up to 192k high res in there in your DSD 128. But you know most people wouldn't at this kind of uh, price level wouldn't even consider using anything higher anyway or, or playing with upsampling and all that. But may have some kind of sound card or converter or whatever which might put out a better signal than the uh, USB can input. But again, we're getting into that rabbit hole that people wouldn't normally consider at this kind of price range. Now there's the optical, which is of course the the uh, optical version of the same thing. And if you do go down the optical route, it does have the advantage that you do isolate the DAC from your computer. And that means you have the, you, the electrical isolation will reduce noise. But optical itself is extremely high jitter. Now, although most DACs can handle can correcting the jitter fine, if you get like me and I got a very long Sony cable one time, which is about three meters and plugged it in, I got very bad musical throughput because in trying all the noise that the DAC was generating trying to connect correct the jitter, could end up kind of sounding really bad. I didn't try it on this one, but if you do go down the optical route or do decide to use optical with your DAX, I do highly recommend going to Sys Concepts in Canada. I'll put the link in the description and buy one of the 1300 strand cables. They're highly worth it because they eliminate most of the jitter through optical. It is a valid science. I'm not talking out of my ass. Anyway, you've got your Bluetooth input as here and the outputs, of course, you have your single ended outputs, RCA and balanced outputs through three pin XLR. So now it's on to the rest of the features. Now I hope you can see the display clearly. One of the uh, probably most slight negatives of this is during, during uh, the day, this display is slightly, well, not that clear. If you look on the right, you can just see the corner of it is much brighter. But all the same, it comes with a uh, remote control where you can access most of the features. 
but all, most of the features you can actually access through the front panel anyway. So you have your, your, your power button here, pressing and holding that will turn the power on and off, and a little, little red light to show power is connected, or put it in standby mode, I suppose, and then it powers on pretty instantly. And here you have your volume control, which you can adjust. I've already actually had it adjusted for uh, level matching for comparisons. And the other thing, if you double tap it, you actually can access the menu system. But I'm going to use the remote anyway, because it's nicer to use the remote to access stuff. Now, when you first get it, of course, you press the C key, because this remote is used by a whole heap of SMSL products. Actually, when I'm using this, the SU9, I have to switch off, because it actually uses the same kind of remote and the same, well, kind of activation, which is a little bit irritating, but it's very unlikely anyone would own two of them. I'm probably one of those rare people. Anyway, so going into the uh, options, you have a whole bunch of features. I'll leave most of these... You can look on the Shenzhen Audio website, you can look on the SMSL website, they go through all the features, all the features. But the interesting thing is the brightness, if you turn it up and down, you can, it goes very faint. BL1 is actually really dark, really dark and perfect for nighttime. And the brightest it gets is there. But you have you can go through the filters. I'm on filter three, which I'll talk about during the sound impressions. And you have digital filters for the uh, DSD, uh, which have, which have uh, various options. But you can set all sorts of stuff in here and including the disabling the uh, preamp mode, although when I tried to do that, it actually didn't work. It, it could still change the volume for some reason. But anyway, it's actually got preamp mode disabled and the volume still changes. Go figure. So other than that, well, that's pretty much, you can look up all the fine details of that, but if you, if you, generally probably the stock settings will probably be fine for most people, although I probably would play around, in this case, with the digital filters. So I listened with the M200 through the SP200 and primarily the Master 9 so I could compare other DACs very easily by switching between them. And of course I listened to 1 kHz tones, sweeps and white noise because that's all important, right? Well, no, I listen to music because sweeps, tones and white noise are for the manufacturer to use to test the device to check that it's functioning correctly or functioning as intended. They're not for random amateur people to play around with and make sweeping declarations about the performance of gear because music is what we buy these things to listen to and that's what's important, right? Anyway, back onto that, I mean, there are no major faults with the uh, sound. I mean, five, you know, five or ten years ago, you had things like maybe the USB input wasn't as good as uh, a high-quality stream from something like a, a good-quality converter or good-quality streamer like this $3,000 sound aware I have here. And in that, there was no major difference which was significant enough for me to care about between, you know, testing between them, which I did briefly. And so, you know, the USB input was fine, and generally listening to it with it was fine. Now, in that, you know, there are little subtle differences between DACs, and the reason comes down to a few things. I mean, if your person this you're seeking out to, you're thinking, oh, this might be the right kind of DAC for me, and you've never bought a high-end DAC before, or even a, even, a, even a basic one, even anywhere near this kind of price, I think you're going to be pretty satisfied. I mean, it's going to be a jump up for something cheap and basic and, and low quality, or maybe there's the sound card in your computer, very likely. And so in that, there's you can say there's nothing wrong. But the difference is maybe between, say, you have the uh, M200, which uses an AKM DAC chip, the 4497, and we have the, the SU9, which uses a Sabre DAC chip, and I've had IFI gear in here, which uses the uh, Burr Brown slash Texas Instruments DACs. There are kind of really subtle differences, which I kind of maybe look at, say, imagine you have a coffee table and you have a glass coffee table. Well, or you have a wood coffee table or you have a metal coffee table. Well, I mean, they still, they all do the same job, but the kind of feeling of having that in your living room is a little bit different. It's kind of like that. So like the AKM is kind of like the glass coffee table. It's kind of like smooth, see-through, that kind of thing. I kind of liken it to like the if, you're stand, if I'm standing here and looking out at the nature outside through my window, well, the, the AKM DAC is like that glass window. Yeah, you can see everything clearly, but it's not quite the same as being out there in nature. And for me, I listen to a lot of acoustic music. That kind of makes a difference, and I kind of notice that now. Now, with, of course, Burr Brown, it's a bit more like the wood coffee table where it's a little more organic kind of sounding, but it's still, it's not a tree, it's still a piece of wood, so it's maybe not quite perfect, but has that kind of more organic feel to it. And, of course, uh, ESS chips are more like, to me, like metal. They have this kind of presence to the sound. And again, it's a different feeling. So it's kind of like that. And I, I know that's kind of a kind of weird analogy, but that's the best way I can put it. And the M200 had that AKM style, smooth kind of sound, which you get, I guess, from putting that kind of DAC chip in a design that's designed to be very kind of flat, linear, uncolored. And of course, these, this thing has sound color settings, but we'll get into that in a bit. 
but it had that very much that kind of characteristic. And I kind of noticed that, and especially if you compare to things like, well, I tried the Moni Multibit, and I thought that's kind of incomparable in price, you know, it's around $250. And we also have Chords Mojo, which is a bit more expensive. Kind of, you can get them for $400 now. But I thought it would be a, something sort of in that range to compare and something which is kind of a, a standard as far as performance goes. Now, in that, there were subtle differences. And they're kind of, this is where music becomes important. I listened to a lot of high quality recordings, which were made with minimum processing. You know, things like the David Chesky binaural stuff, stuff from Native DSD. And there are quite a variety of things, Decca recordings. There's quite a variety out there. Compared to listening to mainstream music, where these differences I'm going to talk about maybe are not so noticeable, then, yeah, okay, so maybe if I listen to the stuff that I listen to in the car, I probably wouldn't notice the differences so much. But, you know, people watch these videos to find out those differences, and some people that becomes a big deal and some people less so. But anyway, so compared to the kind of smooth, like, you know, the, like the piece of glass kind of sound of the M200, the Modi Multibit was a little bit kind of more maybe a little bit more kind of musical. Now we know it's a little bit more of a compromised design. After a few days warm up, there's kind of less difference in there, but it has a little bit more kind of character to the music, a little bit more musicality. It's a little bit more kind of listenable. It doesn't sound quite so flat. And sometimes I find the AKM bass design to sound a little bit flat like I do with the topping. And then, and I sometimes found the Modi Multibit a little bit more musical, although sometimes it could sound a little bit wobbly around the vo with, with vocals sometimes. Though, of course, after a few days that kind of disappears because those industrial DAC chips that are used in the shit audio products do need a little bit of time to thermally stabilize. And this is a valid science. It's the value of a resistor, which these DAC chips are made up of, does drift with time and heat. On the other hand, we have Chords Mojo. Now, that uses, of course, a lot of heavy processing through an FPGA to produce a very accurate sound as much as possible that can, can be in such a small design. And it had, I noticed that especially with like note decay, like a note was plucked and the, the sound decay was a little bit more noticeable with the Mojo, the little bit more kind of depth to the sound. You feel like a more of a 3D space than you do with the uh, M200. A little bit more subtle in there, but still kind of noticeable. I kind of felt the music was more real than I did with the uh, M200. Now, some people have commented on, say, my Topping D90 review, for example. Some people really love the kind of smooth and you know, a glass-like sound of those AKM decks. And some people find them kind of to be unnatural and, and flat sounding. So there is that kind of thing. Some people will love them. Some people will hate them. But if you do love that kind of smooth sound, which I've heard from now, a variety of devices like the Fio M11 Pro, the Cayenne N6 Mark II with, its, uh, the, with one of the modules that has the AKM DAC chip, that kind of characteristic still is very present. And some people like it. Again, some people don't. Some people would rather either the musicality of this or the uh, Chord Mojo for preference, or even one of the resistor ladder decks made from individual resistors that some manufacturers like Audio GD or Socris or others make. So in that, those little differences were subtle. The interesting thing was the this had little sound signature selections. Now, I don't know what those do, and the manufacturer wouldn't say. He just said, just listen for a while. And all manufacturers, well, most anyway, tend to compromise the sound just a tiny bit to add a little bit more musicality. Now, uh, with the SU9 had a variety of them, and I'll probably talk about that more with the SU9. I did see in the measurements with the one kilohertz tone, there were a couple of little sidebands there. And I think maybe the, the uh, SMSL engineer added maybe a tiny bit of kind of... Uh, even order harmonic distortion or that kind of thing. Sometimes they add third order harmonic distortion to add a little bit more excitement to the sound and maybe added a tiny bit of that. It's one of those things you kind of switch it and then try listen for a few days and and see if you feel any different when you're listening to music. And if you're feeling better or for, feeling better, then you leave it. If you're feeling it doesn't sound as good as it did the other day, then you kind of switch it. It's one of those subtle things you wouldn't pass a blind test on, but is kind of something interesting to play around with. Speaking of that, I did play around with the digital filters. Now we do have a variety of digital filters for PCM and DSD using the PCM filters. With that, I noticed that the sound was a little bit kind of flat sounding, kind of especially in combination with the SP200, which I did find a little bit flat sounding as an amplifier as well. Maybe it was too much flat for it being a good thing. And again, it's something like if this is your first system and you decide to buy the pair and get that set up, you probably sound excellent to you. But for someone, of course, used to high-end stuff, it kind of sounds a little bit flat to me. So it depends where you're coming from, how much you'll notice this. But I did find that it's kind of switching to the other filters like filter three, for example, which is a short delay, sharp roll off filter. And again, these things affect the music in, in subtle ways you don't see in regular measurements. They actually affect the timing of the sine waves and can actually alter the actual sine waves. Something you can actually see when you output the sine waves and uh, see them visually. 
in that way, I did find that this little bit of the flatness was removed by switching, say, to filter three. I found kind of filter one and filter six a little bit flat. You know, I played around with a few of them. It's one of those things, if you do own one of these decks, which you can change the filters, just play with it and see how you go. And you might notice a difference, you might not, depends very much on the music. So in that, it still maintained very much its smooth, clear kind of characteristic that the AKM based DAX generally do. And of that, the other thing I could try putting through was DSD. Now DSD, well, it always kind of smooths off the sound a little bit even more and kind of, it's a little bit of a compromise because it, it actually is, is blunting the transients, you know, the, the, the um, impact of like the edges of notes somewhat. Some people like it, some people don't like it. It also takes up a lot of space on your computer. And if you have something that takes up a lot of space on your computer, well, then, you, you know, if you back up my DSD files, which aren't as many hours of music as the PCM stuff I have, take up actually as much space. And that can be absolute pain to back up and uh, store. And one of the things actually I use, I've been using a company called Backblaze for many years to back up all my stuff. You can actually back up a single computer for a flat fee per month or per year, completely unlimited, no throttling, no nothing, as much as you like, uh, encrypted with a key even, so it's absolutely secure. And it's a great service and I highly recommend it from my own experience. If you do lose a computer, you have absolutely everything backed up. And even if it's too much to download again, you can always just ask them to send you, send you a hard drive with all your stuff on it. If you do consider that, you want you can actually for 30 days, you can trial them and back up, no kidding, as much as you like. And I mean, truly unlimited terabytes, if you like. And I have terabytes and terabytes of stuff backed up with them, which took a while, but I managed to back it up. Worth the 30 day trial to see if it works for you. Anyway, back to that. DSD makes the sound even more soft in the M200 and maybe kind of too much of a soft thing. But, you know, some people might like, again, like some people like the smoothness of the AKM deck, some people might like that as well. So again, kind of smooth sounding deck. And if it's maybe you're something you're considering, especially considering that versus the Mojo, consider the form factor too, if it's something you want to sit on your desk, if you specifically want the balanced outputs, because I didn't notice any major difference between balanced and single-ended. And also, you know, the form factor is a, is, a, is a big deal. If you want portability, you buy something that's portable, something to really consider there. So I hope that gives you an idea how the SP200 is. And uh, thanks once again for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified when I have another video out. Also, don't forget, I'm able to make these videos because of the names of the people you see on screen. If you'd like to get my buying advice anytime, if you'd like to see my videos in advance, uh, influence the stuff I, I review even, and uh, well, generally chat to me as well. You can become a supporter. You can actually sign up and ask me questions on the spot, happily answer your questions. And so if you would like to become one of my supporters, do click on the link in the description or follow the link that's on screen. Help me out making these videos and I'll happily help you out in buying gear, which can save you a lot of money in not making the wrong choices. So as always, thanks once again for watching and I'll see you online.